you know they also out. they also they also ran the 14th Street and and the meat market area. But I I, I was I was hoping maybe you would throw that in there a little bit. Um, <laughs> the, I spent a lot of time out there uh, discussing uh, the reality of the situation with, with the girls out on 14th Street. Okay, for this book that I wrote. And that's why it's such a real book, because, I mean, I was out there with Chastity in the middle of the night, you know, asking the girls, hey, you know, do you mind talking to uh, two writers? You know, they must have thought we were freaking crazy, right? But we were saying, you know, where do you get the hormones from? Is it black market? Uh, do you buy them? Do you have a prescription? You know, uh, what is it like to be out here in the middle of the night? Are you scared ever? Does weird shit happen? You know, we really interviewed the real people, um, you know, so the meat market is real, uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, we were there. We were interviewing them for that book, A Road So That It May Rain, to make that fictionalized. Uh, but really, really nonfiction fiction. It's just the best way you could describe that book is nonfiction fiction. Um, now, I don't want to get too far off the, the heated path here because we're right in the middle of it. Uh, I want to go to another murder. This is covered by www.queenty. Dot com and I'll spell it. It's www.queenty.com. We're going to talk about uh, Duwana Johnson. Uh, Duwana Johnson lived to be 40, uh, transgender from Memphis, uh, Tennessee. And uh, in Memphis, uh, there were two officers on the Memphis Police Department who were severely disciplined for beating Duwana Johnson. Uh, one time, I'll mention those guys. Shout out to the officers who beat the shit out of poor Duana, mm-hmm. Officer Bridge, uh, Bridges McRae and Officer James uh, Swain. They were charged with violence against Duana. Uh, Duana decided she was going to sue the department uh, uh, for this and other um, smaller forms of harassment. And she never got to get into the courthouse. And I'll tell you why. She was found execution-style murder. A shot to the back of the head, uh, and she uh, uh, obviously died from that in 2008 in November, and that's not too long ago. Uh, an execution style, okay? Why was that? Was it um, was it maybe a cop who knew how to shoot? Uh, I don't know. That's just an idea. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of shocking evidence there's out there. There's a lot there. of girls out there who are going to be tuning in and are listening to this show who actually been out there in the streets of New York City and actually has been through this era. And, and now you're like putting, you always ask yourself questions, right? And you wonder, mm-hmm. you know, you wondered. And late, who, who would have thought that years later, you know, somebody would come along on the radio and spill the other half? It happens that way. It's, it's really freaky. Um, I listen to a lot of interviews on YouTube uh, and a lot of streaming interviews on the Internet. And because of that technology, we're getting a lot of information out there about a lot of things. And it's just blown up. And uh, a lot of stuff's coming out of the woodworks, um, you know. Um, now, I want to I go on, uh, keep on that path. Uh, the uh, Tasha de Jesus, okay, is another trans person... Uh, who uh, uh, apparently an estranged boyfriend killed her. Uh, However, here's what's strange about this story. The estranged boyfriend didn't get a chance to get arrested or anything. He was found dead hanging on a fence just after Taja was found dead. Spooked. So spooky. Spooky right there. That's spooky. Spooky, but still spooked. Still spooked. I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Still spooked. Now we have a. This girl was beautiful, man. She was stunning. She was like this cute little beautiful uh, Filipino trans. Her name was Jennifer Lauda. And in my research, uh, we're talking about outside of the United States now. I've seen a lot of posts on Facebook about this one. Did you? Did you? Yeah. yeah. Now this I one is. I posted a couple times in the radio station chat on Facebook. Um, This one is really strange because she was uh, in a prenuptial agreement and engagement to be married to a U.S. Marine, okay? Right. Uh, A U.S. Marine had fallen in love with her, and uh, they committed to a marriage. But instead of following through, apparently U.S. Marine Joseph uh, murders his (coughs) bride-to-be, the poor Jennifer Laude, (coughs) and he murdered her at Calzone Lodge 
in Olasapa City, Philippines. Um, now, I just want to point out some strange things that have come out of the Marines. Uh, one of the, uh, the most famous school shooters was a Marine. Uh, other famous murderers that Marines uh, include Lee Harvey Oswald, okay, was an ex-Marine, uh, who acted, apparently acted in um, a conspiracy to kill the President uh, Kennedy back in 63. So we've had some strange right, stuff right. come out of the Marines. Right. Um, there's going to be um, uh, www.advocate.com uh, does talk about uh, the, um, uh, let's see, uh, murders uh, this year. Uh, this year is close to me. Uh, a personal um, acquaintance of mine, I only met uh, Christina Gomez Infinity a few times. She was a member of the House of Infinity. Uh, she was involved with the culture down in Miami. Uh, Christina was murdered by an estranged boyfriend this year, just recently. She is one of uh, what we now see of seven murders of trans people in the year 2015. This is an alert call. We're on a red alert here, and why are we? Uh, we have seven people dead by the middle of February only, uh, and uh, these reports coming in, the statistics show that that's a murder of a trans person per week. Uh, this is outrageous. Uh, if you were to extrapolate that statistic into 2016 at the same rate uh, of increase, you would get the insane statistic of a murder per day. You'd get a murder per day extrapolating the statistic for 2016 of, of trans people. That would be uh, just an unbearable uh, 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 the depopulation of the uh, transgender society. Wow. I'll name uh, some of the ones that uh, have died this year. We'll give a shout out to them who passed, who were very vivacious and young people. Uh, Bri Golek who was only 22. Uh, Yasmin Vash Payne was 33. Uh, Ty Underwood was 21. And Lamia Beard uh, was a young 30 uh, and an uh, activist in her hometown. So, um, Basically, uh, I think that's really all I have, and I really want to thank you for allowing me to give this journalistic presentation. Uh, any questions that anybody has, uh, this would be the time to to open that up, I gather. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're not so good. We're not so good. We're not done yet. I want to uh, uh, recap uh, a couple of things. Like, what was yeah. your relationship to Mother Erica Divianche Shade, Mother Arbor okay. Latex, Mother Banji Angie Infinity, and Mother Gabriella Lang? Okay, good call. Um, those people were people in my life, um, especially Angie Infinity, who was became a good friend. Um, I had a relationship with Chastity back in the day while we were uh, writing the book, and we did live together for. Uh, quite a number of years during that relationship, and Angie uh, became uh, just part of our household. Uh, Angie would uh, dress her babies, you know, uh, with us. Angie would. Um, I'm trying to do uh, this without crying, because <laughs> these are these these are this is my family that we're talking about. Yeah, it's in mine too. In mine too. Uh, <laughs> believe me, and and, and it, it, it's been a number of years, and uh, for me, the crying is over, but the the the, the happiness. To have known these people is what stirs me because they're gone and I can't get back to them and uh, they were an integral part of influencing my way of seeing the world and uh, just the, the, the happiness uh, that comes with community because uh, you know we came together you know we came together uh, Mother Arbor yeah um, you know, this was a, a major factor uh, in my life, uh, Arbert, I looked up to, I'd say as a hero to this day, you know, a real hero, someone who was real and could laugh and, and could, you know, um, uh, uh, throw a little bit of serious shade and everything else, but at the same time uh, knew how to orient uh, the community, the children, towards a more successful lifestyle towards a more fulfilling lifestyle uh, there, there's also um, Erica Shade I have to mention Erica Shade when you bring Erica up um, Erica was probably Erica Kane darling yes Erica Kane was <laughs> so well known but that's so on another episode well honey we'll get into that yeah that is it. oh my god that's yeah, a whole other episode 
<laughs> I mean, I was at her funeral. You know, I I was at her deathbed in uh, in in when she died in the hospital. I was there. You understand? That's how I knew her, and I uh, was at her funeral. And something very interesting came up at her funeral. Uh, someone was talking to uh, Chastity about the fact that we wrote a book, and that person actually made a strange prophecy at Erica Kane's funeral and said that me and Danny would eventually write a second book, and we had no clue why that stranger who happened to be there said that but uh it turns out he's right after all these years we are actually trying to collaborate on a second book after all these years uh even though that uh work would be in abstentia danny's uh now living on the west western part of the country um in yes, the southwest yes in florida shout, yeah. out, shout out to that so that's an interesting thing um and, and gabriel lang uh was somebody who was um uh, just a startling uh, person, both visually, I mean, just a great, amazing-looking person, an amazing person in their personality, somebody who is really smart, uh, someone who is really uh, cultured, and someone who is really uh, together. And uh, just an important uh, people that, that came across my path in, in, in a deep way. In a deep way. Amazing. Now... A Rose So That It May Rain, available now on Amazon.com. Why were some of the real names of the characters in the novel changed to fictitious names? Let, let me give you a little background on how that, that came up. Um, when we did decide to write a book, um, we weren't sure whether it would be nonfiction or fiction. Uh, because I'm predominantly, my favorite style is fiction of writing, and I'm... I'm uh, I studied fiction writing in college, and I got a degree in, in, uh, in uh, English literature uh, in order to formulate my fiction writing uh, to facilitate that. Uh, I decided to kind of press for a fictional story uh, that would be a beautifully told tale uh, of the real scene, which is to say you would have to fictionalize those names uh, in order to make it a fiction book, but then just to hide reality as almost like a bed sheet. As soon as you pull the bed sheet under, uh, over, uh, off, I should say, uh, in that book, you, you really have the real scene going on. And um, I think that's probably the reason it ended up fiction, is uh, because I'm predominantly a fiction writer. And it was really uh, Chastity, who's uh, it, you know, uh, an amazing, uh, has an amazing memory for things and an amazing uh, ability to recreate scenes and stories from the past. So this person's talent really lies in storytelling, and my talent really lies in actually getting the stuff on paper. Uh, the combination uh, worked in order to create a, you know, the book is over 300 pages long, and uh, really is an epic story. It's an epic love story. Uh, it's a story of the, um, uh, the struggle, you know, the streets and everything else. So. Wow. Amazing. And for those listeners that don't know who Sheila Mabry is, tell us about her and what her relation to the gay men's health crisis in New York, and, and tell us about her relations to that. Okay. Um, I just want to, now that you bring that up, uh, the gay men's health crisis uh, was founded by um, uh, Geffen, you know, the Geffen uh, records label. Uh, that that millionaire, um, I believe his name is George Kevin. I'd have to double check that. Uh, anyway, he was the main funder of that. He saw the need for uh, the health crisis with the AIDS um, uh, issue. Uh, now, so the Gay Men's Health Crisis is the major organization. Uh, the House of Latex was literally called the House of Latex Project, and that's because it was a project of the GMHC. So that project... Um, had to answer back to the upper management, you see, right. of the gay men's health crisis. Sheila Mabry uh, was, I don't know whether she's still involved there, she was in the upper management of the gay men's health crisis and not in charge of the House of Latex project, although I believe she was what's called a uh, communications liaison uh, uh, to the House of Latex project. She might have been an overseer. Uh, but it's really being run by the Gens Men's Health uh, the Crisis. Men's health crisis right. Yeah. Now, the Gay Men's Health Crisis, I should say, began to attract some interesting attention during its heyday, and uh, it began to get funding from all sorts of people, rich New York folks who wanted to donate every year. Uh, but some 
of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, okay, and this is 